more I thought about it, this is where my thought was driving me. It's not, uh, really, it's not what I wasn't looking for this conclusion at all. It's funny, it wasn't like I, I believed it and then I started looking for the arguments to support it. It wasn't like that at all. I didn't believe it, but the arguments, the, the philosophy I was developing kept pushing me and pushing me until I began to think, oh, okay, uh, that's what I, that's what I'm thinking about animal rights. That's what I'm thinking about here. I, I know because if animals do have rights, the only adequate response is not indifference and it's not reform. It is abolition. The whole blooming thing is wrong. That's my lawyer. <laughs> so, let me talk a little bit about the philosophical part of it. And as I, this is where I said, I don't think I can convince you of the, the, the truth that animals have rights, but what I can do is try to explain uh, what I'm talking about here. There are different types of rights that uh, people talk about. There are legal rights, of course, like the legal right to vote, and the legal right to marry, the legal right to divorce, to uh, own or inherit property. And the thing about these rights is that they are uh, created by people. Uh, uh, we make these legal rights by passing laws and, uh, or by uh, uh, other legislative means. And that they are obviously not, not uh, universal or equal. Uh, the right to vote uh, was not always shared by women or of, of people of color. Uh, the right to vote is not shared by other people in other parts of the world today. Uh, rights change over time. Legal rights change over time depending on what people do, depending on what legislative bodies do, what, what despots do, what laws are made. Laws change over time. Moral rights, on the other hand, when we talk about these, we're talking about something that are rights that are not created by people. We're, what we're trying to do is talk about something, rights that are universal and equal. If you look at the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, when they talk about the right to be uh, not to be tortured, the right of freedom of religion, the right of freedom of assembly, the right uh, to petition your government. When they talk about this, they're declaring that these rights are, belong to all human beings. All human beings, whether they're recognized as legal rights in, in a particular country or not. They're trying to say, and they belong to all of us equally, whether our, our, our nation recognizes them or not. And a, a large part of the political struggle in any country is to transform uh, the law so that the moral rights of individuals are recognized as legal rights. So that the, the right to vote, the right to, uh, to be spared torture, the right to freedom of assembly and the right rest, that those rights that we have uh, as moral rights are recognized as, as legal rights. A, a lot of history is like the struggle involved there. When we're talking about the rights of animals, then primarily what we're trying to do is talk about their moral rights, legal rights they don't have. No animal has any serious legal right to them. Animals have laws where they're, they're covered by, law, by, by uh, laws. There are laws that cover animals. But no animal has legal standing in this country. You can't, you can't go into court and, and represent an animal. And it's not, it's not something that happens. And in fact, as you know, uh, just a few weeks ago, the Congress of the United States passed as an amendment to the Farm Bill uh, a provision that said that birds and rodents are explicitly excluded from the provisions of the Animal Welfare Act. Between 95 and 99 percent of the animals used in research in America are birds and rodents. But moral rights have various characteristics that I think are important for us to re understand. And the first thing is that they have a relation to obligations. And I always use this analogy that but think about a coin. And rights and obligations are two sides of the same coin. That is, if you have a right to life, then I have an obligation, that's the other side of the coin, I have an obligation to respect your life. If you have a right to bodily integrity, then I have an obligation to respect your bodily integrity. That's why it's important, see, as soon as I recognize your right, I have to recognize my obligation. And that's why you have lots of conflicts and contests about who has what rights. Because if, if you recognize this right, then you, you're buying into your obligation. That means you, we, must behave in a certain way. So if all Americans have a, a right to health care, affordable quality health care, 
If we do, all Americans have that right, that means we have an obligation. And that's why a lot of people want to say, I don't want to recognize that right because that means I have to do something. The other thing about, about uh, second thing about rights, at least the rights I'm talking about, is this notion of no trespass. It's like, think about my right to bodily integrity. And what I'm suggesting is think, of, think about that right like this, that as I walk through the world, there's this like invisible sign that says, keep your hands off this body. It already belongs to somebody. This space is already occupied by me. And, and no one is to trespass, no one is to enter this geography, this geographical space, my body, without the owner's permission. That's the idea of, of the integrity of the body. So the idea, if you were to do something harmful to my body, you'd be violating my right. You'd be and also failing to fulfill your obligation, assuming I haven't done anything to to merit that. And the other thing I, I want to mention about, about rights is this notion of trump. I've got my little props, props here. <laughs> and I've got to get a better example, of that, and I hope somebody will help me because this is, shows again how old I am. My example comes from the game Bridge, which nobody plays anymore, apparently. <laughs> That's one of the ways I got through college. In addition to working as a butcher, I won a lot of money playing Bridge. <laughs> But anyhow, a bridge is, a, a, is what's called a trump game, where you, you basically bid and determine whether clubs, diamonds, hearts, or spades are going to be the trump card. And in a game like that, then what happens is, suppose diamonds are trump, and, and somebody, somebody, this four people were playing, somebody plays the queen of spades. That's a pretty big spade. And then somebody, the next person plays the king of spades. That's a very big spade. And then the person plays the ace of spades. In, in a game like bridge, if diamonds are trump and I don't have any space, this card here is more powerful than the queen, it's more powerful than the king, it's more powerful than the ace. It wins. It wins the trick. It's more powerful. It wins the trick. Well, the thing about rice, then, is this. When we say that they're trump, what we're trying to say is that in the moral game, the rights of the individual, your rights, my rights, who have had rights, the rights of the individual are more important than other powerful moral considerations. And in particular, respecting the rights of the individual is more important than any obligation we have to benefit society, to benefit other people. You're not, we're not justified in violating the rights of an individual in order to benefit somebody else, even society at large. There are famous examples of this. Remember the Tuskegee experiment? <coughs> you familiar with the Tuskegee experiment? Where where uh, hundreds of uh, African-American uh, sharecroppers were uh, given syphilis and, and not treated for it so they could see what happened. But they, 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 told, they told them, you've got bad blood, you have to take this medicine. It was no medicine, it was a sugar pill. And they watched them die. They watched them die from syphilis so that they could learn something about the uh, progression of the disease that might be useful for other people, syphilis suffers in the future. But it's a violation of the rights of the individual to do that. That's what we're trying to say when we say that individuals have rights, when we talk about ourselves. So that's why, again, see, if animals <coughs> have rights, the only adequate response is abolition. We can't say, well, look, we like to eat them. That's not a sufficiently good reason to violate anybody's rights. We benefit from doing the research. That's not a sufficiently good reason for doing the research. We're, it's a tradition to do it, it's not a sufficiently good reason to violate anybody's rights. If animals have rights, the only <coughs> adequate response to raising them for food, the only adequate response to using them in research, the only adequate response in using them for items of fashion is to stop doing it. If they have rights. But of course then the question is, do they have rights? That's the, that's the fundamental question, do they? And that's the question that I explore at length in, in my writings. And I'll just simply say, look, there are factual questions we have to ask to make any headway here. Uh, what are any other animals like uh, uh, physiologically? What are they like uh, anatomically? Uh, what are they like psychologically? And here's what we know. Here's what we know. The animals we raise for food, the animals we trap and ranch for fur, the animals we use in laboratories, for scientific purposes, the animals we train to entertain us, they're like us, and we're like them. Physiologically, 
anatomically, psychologically. Here's what I mean by psychologically. This is one of the most important elements of, of my philosophy, and, but I think it's just common sense. It's not, it's not like, oh gosh, this is like really abstract stuff. I think it's really just plain common sense. Other animals, these animals I'm talking about, are in the world, they're aware of the world, they're aware of what happens to them, what happens to them matters to them. Let me do that again. They're in the world, they're aware of the world, they're aware of what happens to them, what happens to them matters to them. It makes a difference to how their life goes for them, how their story unfolds, what it's like to be them. Those those dogs in the pictures and those cow, cows in the pictures and those chickens in the pictures. There's a them there. There's a somebody there behind those eyes, living in the world, living their life. And what happens then matters to them. And, and then see, in that respect, they're just like us. We're in the world. Where are the world? Where are the world? What happens to us matters to us. We're the same, fundamentally the same. Uh, us and them. And so, uh, somebody says, well, yeah, okay, okay, there is that similarity, I grant you that, but look, uh, here's who has rights. Here's who has rights. Those who are rational and autonomous, that's who. This is what the philosophers say, most of the philosophers. This is what most of the philosophers say. This is like, like uh, the standard view, I swear, um, amongst philosophers. And rational means this, that you can think about what you're doing. You can say, oh, if I do this, that will happen. Or if I do this, that will happen, and you'll be affected. And, I mean, I can think about what I'm doing if I'm rational. And autonomous means, having thought about it, I can say, I'll do this rather than that. I can make a free choice. I can make that free choice. That's who has rights. You happen to have them. You happen to have them. All of us happen to have them. Isn't that convenient? Isn't that nice? So keep your hands off my body. Respect my life. Grant me my freedom because I'm rational and autonomous. Isn't it interesting? I'm making the argument and it so happens that I get covered by the conclusion. Uh, but, so it just works out there. Uh, but, but so th this is the way. And, and see, all you can do is say, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. Except there are just a lot of human beings that don't have rights then. Because there are a lot of human beings that aren't rational and autonomous. I'm not talking about anybody in this room, but I mean, uh, but there are a lot of a lot of human beings that just can't put it together. They don't have the, the, the mental wherewithal to think that way, and 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 to think through choices. They just don't have that capacity. But we certainly don't say, and I, I mean, I'm a great children's advocate and advocate of the mentally disabled and all that. But we don't say, well, they don't have rights because they can't do that. We don't say that. I wouldn't for a minute say that. And they, 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 they do have rights and should be protected in my view. So you can raise a standard. Here's the, here's the plot. You can raise a standard. You can say, here's the standard for having rights. And, and you can pretty much guarantee that no animal is going to satisfy it. You can. But a lot of human beings aren't going to satisfy it either. Now that's your dilemma, isn't it? Because especially the people who are against animal rights, they don't, they don't want to say, well, children don't have rights either. They don't want to have, they don't, they're not saying the mentally disabled don't have rights. So their problem is one of consistency. 